Hey, how you doing, gang? Uh, this is Dr. O. Um, welcome you to uh, an introduction to the research methods in psychology. And I'm sporting my pork pie hat uh, just for a good measure. And I'm finally figuring out how to uh, go about this new uh, editing program that I have. So let me know if this works out well for you. But what I wanted to talk to you about today was uh, pretty much the whole idea of, of, of science and the research methods that create or that state whether something is a science or not. So a lot of debate going around right now, you can't trust the science, as Fauci would say, and then you got other people on the other side who are saying, you know, well, there's science, you're not testing certain things, and we're going to go through that, um, <clears throat> through this to give you an understanding of what science is. Now, one of the things that I want you to think about too is psychology is considered a, a young science um, where you have the science of biology chemistry you know physics all those things are science because they go through the same research methods that we do or we try to go by what they do now they're a hard science not meaning that it's um, you know hard to do biology science or chemistry science so although some people have difficulty with it but it's something that is tangible. Psychology is a soft science because it's we're measuring things that aren't necessarily tangible. It's like saying, how do you measure the mind? You know, what is the mind? How can you put your fingers on it? Well, how's it tangible that way? It's hard. It's hard to do. But we still go through the research methods that the hard sciences go through. <clears throat> since hence we are then considered a science. So let's take a look at. <clears throat> first step here what I want you to do when you think about any kind of research I want you to think about it in terms of it being um, it being a puzzle okay we're trying to figure out this this situation this phenomena the thing that's going on in the world right now or at least one specific thing that we're trying to make sense out of it and it's different pieces of the puzzle because there's so many different variables so each variable is considered a piece of that puzzle so if you take a look at this gentleman here, okay, this is a picture, high school, senior, you know, wrestler, uh, you know, did a lot of uh, great athletic things. Um, only thing is that he was a smoker or more importantly used uh, chewing tobacco, okay, as part of his life. So these pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall into place, different parts of his life. Okay, so we know that research says that, uh, that um, uh, can't, uh, smoking and using tobacco, nicotine, all those things cause cancer, right? So you have that connection of the cancer-causing agents, which he has been using. So this is his picture before he died with, <clears throat> you know, because of the cancer that hit him and because of, you know, the way that his life was lived. So we have that person as the different pieces of his puzzle to explain his life and what he had gone through and how research in tobacco use and things like that would cause cancer kind of fit into his life as well. Main thing I want you to think about when you're talking about the goals of psychology is the first thing is we need to describe what the behavior is and we need to be real specific on what those behaviors are. So if you have, um, let's say for example, <clears throat> I like using uh, Pinal County as being, um, and I don't know where the rate is now, but uh, we were like number one in teen pregnancy uh, in, per capita, which means for the amount of people that we have in Pinal County, even though it's rural, the, the rate of teen pregnancy is pretty high compared to other places in the country. I don't know exactly where we fall now. Um, I'd have to check that out. But we want to describe what the what the behavior is, and the result of it is, you know, again, sex, having kids, being pregnant. That's one of the issues. Then we want to try to explain the behavior. We want to try to figure out, okay, how does this happen? Why? I mean, trying to explain what is the behavior that's going on with this. Then hopefully, by understanding and explaining it, we'll be able to predict it. If we can predict the behavior, then hopefully we'll be able to control it. In other words, not have as many teens in Pinal County become pregnant. Okay, so question is, how do we do that? And so we'll take a look at the scientific method. And basically, the scientific method is a, is an approach 
to gaining knowledge and trying to figure out what is going on. And it's a method where you are gathering a hypothesis. You have a thought. What is it that I want to test? You want to collect the data, and then you want to try to explain the data. right? So that's the same process, both for the hard science and the soft science of psychology. Now, the thing I want you to be aware of, too, is, is the difference between something that is empirical versus something that is subjective. Okay. So somebody could say that, you know, yeah, definitely, I believe that, you know, uh, people who, the amount of ice cream that's eaten causes teen pregnancy. Uh, no, there's no real connection between that. I haven't seen any research that, had, that, that states that, okay? Um, or they're seeing certain situations that are happening in, their, in other people's lives. Well, my cousin says that this, this is why she got pregnant. And that, okay, that's situational, that's subjective, but you need to look at empirical. Empirical means measurable. Can we actually measure the amount of teens in, in different situations, different variables, in something tangible? So empirical means tangible, because everybody has their own subjective view of the world. I mean, take a look at what's going on now. You know, there's a whole bunch of different views of the world that are driving people crazy trying to figure out what the hell's going on, right? Okay, so difference between empirical being something that's measurable versus something that is just subjective. Is well, This is what the news is telling you today, is that there's there's been all these deaths right now or people are being infected. Okay, they're infected, but they don't tell you exactly what numbers. And how do they get those numbers? See, one of the things about research and about being the scientific method, you want to be able to question. That is so key. And one of the things that I, I, I didn't say this in one earlier video that I wanted to, uh, excuse me, but I'm going to say it now, is that question, question, question. I want you to be able to be a critical thinker, not just go by what the media says, not just go by what your uncle says or whatever somebody else says, or even what I say. Okay, I want you to do your own research. I want you to question, question authority. There's nothing wrong with that. It's question me. Because the more you question me, the more I have to take a look. Am, am I coming from the right point of view or not? Okay, question yourself. So how did I come up with that thought? Where did that thought come from? Where did that fear come from? If we take a look at all of those things and question and become critical thinkers, our lives are going to be a lot more clear. If there's confusion, which is a lot of confusion going on in the world right now, and it's affecting us psychologically, a lot of people are becoming depressed because they don't know what to think. Well, do I wear two masks? Do I wear three masks? Well, do I not wear a mask at all? Do I get the shot? Do I get, you know, it's driving people crazy, so to speak, because they can't get anything tangible. Because, as I've heard before, the goalposts are being moved, which means they say one thing and all of a sudden they change something else. So I want you to think critically. I want you to question authority. I want you to question me, question the book, okay? Ask those questions. So, because if you're not able to a answer the, or if you're not able to ask those questions, then there's something wrong going on. If they don't want to answer it, eh, I always say to to, to uh, my clients or my uh, <clears throat> my students, if ever you go to a doctor, medical doctor, people are normally, well, they're a doctor, so I'm not gonna uh, question them what they're doing. Hell no. No, no, it's your health. If you have a family member that's there, it's their health that you're asking. You ask them, especially therapists. If there's a therapist that you're going to, you ask them, what is your approach? How are you planning on helping? And what are the, you know, explain them to me in layman's terms where I can understand them. If they refuse to, run. Don't walk. Run away from there. Because if they can't explain it, then they don't know what the hell they're doing. So I want you to keep that in mind. I want you to be a critical thinker. And this is what the research and, and research methods and we're critically thinking, trying to ask questions and ask more questions. Okay. Anyway, so moving right along. So let's take a look at the steps that you go through with the scientific method. First, again, you have to identify the problem. Okay. We got teens that are pregnant in Pinal County. Okay. Let's use that as an example for right now. Okay. So we identified that. Now we have to design a study. It says, hmm. What's the best way to study teens getting pregnant? Hmm. Let's go through that. Then you collect the data, analyze the data, draw conclusions from there, and then you communicate the findings. Now, 
why would you need to communicate the findings? This means how, why is it that you have to share with everyone what your findings are and how you did it? When I did my dissertation, that was a research. I had to have a methodology section. I had to explain how I did it step by step and how what, what conclusions that I came from that. So it's a whole set of like five chapters. And the reason why you do that is so that somebody else can go back later and do exactly the same thing you did to see if there was a different outcome. Okay. Think about it with the puzzle. You have the puzzle piece and you're like, hmm, have you ever done this before? You're like, okay, I got this puzzle piece. Well, it kind of looks like um, my fit, right? Hey, come on, babe, come here. Let me, what do you think about this? Is this fit? What do you think? Is this part of the eye or over here? Or... So what it does is you're communicating this information to them, and then somebody can verify whether that research was correct or not. So that's the whole point of doing research and trying to figure out what's going on and trying to figure out this puzzle. Check out COVID. COVID, there's so many different, you know, they want to keep one kind of narrative, it sounds like. And there anybody else who goes against it or questions it, it's like, oh no, get away. Yeah, you know, this, I know what this piece is. This piece goes right here because I'm the expert. No, 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 no. You have to allow for questioning and you have to allow for retesting and figuring out whether or not what they're saying to you is correct or not. If you don't, then you're just going, well, they're the doctor and they know what they're doing. Mm -mm. No, no, no. So again, communicating findings is extremely important when you're going through and doing research. You need to find out, does this fit here? Because you may find out some research will go, well, you know what? This didn't work the way I planned it. I didn't, so we're going to have to look at it a different way. It didn't fit here. Okay, it didn't fit in this spot. So let's see, maybe it's over here. No, no, no. Then you come back and do another research uh, with a different question, a different hypothesis. Yeah, maybe it fits here. Oh, there it is. Perfect. So it fits in that place. Got it? Okay. So anyway, moving right along. Dung -a -dung -dung -a -dung. All right. So I wanted to tell you the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. This is where students typically get it confused. Now, a theory is more of a systematic explanation of a phenomenon. So we take a look at um, a teen pregnancy. You have this big wide circle uh, theory of why teens in Pinal County tend to get pregnant more often than anybody else per capita in the U.S. I think we dropped down to number two. I'm not sure uh, again. So you have this large theory. Okay. Now the difference between a theory and a hypothesis is a hypothesis is a small part of that theory. Okay. It's just a little part of that, that, um, that puzzle piece. That's part of that theory. Okay, it's the testable part of it. You're not testing a theory. You're testing a hypothesis. Okay, you're specifically saying, okay, this is what the hypothesis is. This is what I'm thinking that it, it, you know, it's specific. Let's see if this piece of the puzzle fits into this. This is my hypothesis. This uh, lady, for example, <clears throat> uh, she did working with kids in schools. She wanted to find out whether creativity was um, or competition affected creativity or not and so she that was her hypothesis she wanted to see you know does competitive affect your or your art ability ability to do art so let's take go through more uh, you identify the problem clarify uh, precision scientists must specify clearly what they are testing in their hypothesis they need to know specifically what it is that you're testing because if you don't know you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to to, to uh, explain it or at least be specific. Okay, then you have to choose a study on how to study the the problem. So here's here's a couple of uh, different ways of you could study uh, teen pregnancy, for example. Okay, first is naturalistic observation or a field observation, and basically what this is, it goes down to the environment. So let's take a look at teen pregnancy. Okay, try to apply this design. Do we go over and see where kids are having sex in order for them to get pregnant? That's on the field. That's, uh, you know, maybe a party. Maybe you go out on a date or you're sitting in the back there and taking notes. No, not going to work. Okay, typically these type of natural observations are if you're watching gorillas and behavior in the natural habitat. Habitat. Also, you can take a look at 
Maybe gorillas in the zoo. But that's a different type of you know, environment that they're looking at. So it's not in the natural environment of the, the jungle, but you're actually looking them in the zoo. So therefore you identify that as gorillas in the zoo as opposed to gorillas in the wild. Okay, so that would not work for, for studying and researching teens who get pregnant in Pinal County. Then you have a laboratory type of, of design. This right here is basically your uh, typical or stereotypical uh, sci psychology research where you have the, the researcher in a white lab coat and the person comes in and there's a two-way mirror or there's a mirror then you, you're looking at them and you know they're asking them questions at the clipboard and stuff it's very sanitary and um, so if you try to apply this to teens who get pregnant I don't think that's gonna work well because usually whenever there's a situation like this as to control so you can control the temperature you can control you know uh, different things in there and that's why you would use this I wouldn't would not work well I believe in finding out why teens get pregnant in Pinal County case study now a case study is a type of design where you are actually looking at one individual pretty much say for example I'm a therapist I have a teen that comes in she got pregnant this is the case that I'm talking to you about and you guys are our therapists psychologists and I'm explaining to you, your researchers, and says, well, this right here was this teen who got pregnant, and she was, you know, uh, at home and alone, and parents didn't give them a lot of guidance, and just was, I don't know, horny one day, and then boom, she got pregnant. Right, okay, this type of thing. So it's one case study. Now, this could fit, but what it does is it only gives you one look at one person. Now, Understand there's a lot of different variables that can contribute to them becoming pregnant as teens. Okay, so the best way to do this is through doing a research survey. With a research survey, you're asking, you have the ability to ask different types of questions. Because many times when I talk about um, teens who are pregnant, I get, uh, uh, and when I was doing the face-to-face -face classes, I would get uh, students saying, uh, well, there's no sex education. Okay, write down sex education. Uh, okay, lack of it. Okay, well, there's uh, too boring. Okay, boring in Pinal County, so what else are you going to do? You're going to have sex. Okay, so you have these type of things. Um, you also have um, parents working two days. You have, I don't know if you've heard of latchkey kids, but latchkey kids are basically kids who have keys. They would have it around their neck, and there's a key to the house. And the parents are working because they have to because you have two, you know, that's have both parents working or a single parent and they're not at home. So they have the key to the house. So they're a latchkey kid. And um, so you have those type of things, peer pressure, okay, drinking, alcohol, those type of different things could contribute to teens getting pregnant in Pinal County. So this one here is a better way because you can ask all of those questions. What is your parent involvement like? What's your parent do they how they talk to you about sex? What sex in school? I mean, I mean, there's a big controversy right now. And let me ask you this and put put this down in the, the comments uh, if you want to. Um, how early should they talk about sex? I mean, there's a whole mess of stuff going on right now. It's, it's just crazy where, you know, you have. questioning you have you know do you introduce that in school you know do, do, do you introduce uh, have what was it what was it called it was um, uh, oh yeah, it's not coming to me but I can picture it in my head um, where they had the, the the coming in and reading to the student to the to the kids young kids we're, we're talking kindergartners you were um, uh, drag queen reading time I've heard that out there what else have you guys heard that's kind of crazy and, and I mean that's not my, that was in my world type of thing and now you know is it confusing I mean is it is transgender now introducing that early confusing kids because they haven't quite gotten that connection yet with it again these are the things that do they belong in the school is my question um, and would that help 
And if you guys had sex education when you were younger in school, or was it your parents that taught to you? Normally, it's your friends that you learn from. Which they learn from their friends, which means there's a, not a whole hell of a lot of, you know, uh, good guidance there when you're actually talking to your friends, I believe. Okay, anyway, so if you want to comment on the bottom there on all those things, let me know. So I, think believe, that, uh, I believe that the research survey method is the best way of gathering the data so that you can analyze it. <clears throat> okay, now the random assignment is basically taking a look if you had two different groups and this is what um, what the lady that I'm going to be talking to you about uh, with the motivation and creativity or, or competition and creativity um, research that she did with the, with the kids uh, looking at random assignments so it's like having two hats and then or one hat with everybody's name in there and you randomly select into two different groups okay now why would you do that so well you don't want to get the cream of the crop in other words, you don't want to say, well, all the, all the um, uh, creative people are going to go into this hat and all the, uh, all the not very creative people are going to go into here because it skews it and messes up the whole result. So you have, they have to have equal chance of getting into each of those um, different groups because then that makes your, uh, your results a lot more uh, vibrant. <clears throat> so this is the way that it breaks down for her. Random assignment, she has one group which is experimental, experimental group, one that is a control group. Experimental group actually gets the treatment, so to speak. Okay, let's say for this, the drug treatment, any kind of drug treatment that, uh, that they do, except for now, I'm kind of assuming, is that you have an experimental group, and then you have the control group. Now, the control group is usually given a placebo, okay, which is like a sugar pill. They don't know whether they're in the control group or the experimental group. Okay? If they're actually doing actual drug testing and, and uh, making sure that the drug is, is working, um, which they haven't done here with the COVID stuff because it was emergency stuff, boom. So they really haven't done any of that that I know of. I mean, if you know of some, please let me know. Um, you know, something I can always learn. But at the same time, you have the control group that there's no control group. I, myself, well, I'm not gonna say it. Anyway, the control group here, and then you have the the um, experimental group. Experimental group is the one that gets the treatment. Now you have a, a, a blind and a double blind type of experiment. The blind, uh, single blind, means that um, just the people who are involved in the research don't know which one they're in. Okay, but the researcher does. So I would know who was in which group. Experimental group, control group. I know which ones are. That's single blind. Double blind is that I have no idea who's in what group. And they don't have any idea who's in what group. Okay. In this one, it's a double blind, um, or at least the people who are, are, um, are grading the uh, results from the students with the creativity, they don't know which ones are in any of the groups. So they're not aware of that. Okay, so what she's looking at, independent variable <clears throat> being, you know, the question is, does competition competing for prizes make you more creative? That's basically her hypothesis. She's assuming that it does. She thinks, yes, if you're competing for something, you're going to be more creative. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure if this, uh, I don't know if you heard my wife calling. It's an interruption to come through, but I'll kind of continue on and see if not I can just edit it out. Uh, anyway, so I was talking about the experimental group and the control group and what she has done with this. So the experimental group consists of subjects who receive some type of treatment, like I said. They actually get the, 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 the drug that they're testing to see, okay? They're regarded to be the independent variable. <clears throat> the control group, again, gets like a, 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 salt, a sugar pill. They don't know. They just know they're taking something. They think they're in, they don't know whether they are or not because if they do, then you have also, um, you know, something that uh, will affect the outcome, um, which is part of that placebo effect. Because sometimes people will take medication, and if they believe that it does well, then they get healthier, or it, it, it gives them a good effect compared to uh, the experimental group. So it's kind of hard to tell. So in other words, if you give the experimental group or you did the drug that you're testing, and then you give the control group the placebo, but the, the control group believes strongly 
that they are getting the drug, and they're this one gets healthier, and then this one gets healthier has a result that they're looking for, then they kind of um, questions whether this actual, um, you know, exp the drug itself was giving the right effect that they wanted to because they're too close together. In other words, it could have been a placebo or it could have been, um, you know, the drug itself. It's hard to tell. Ideally, it would be, well, control group comes down, then everybody gets healthy and who's an experimental group, so they can tell the difference between the two. So, you continue on. Okay. Doo -doo. Come on. Click with me. All right. Independent group. Again, condition or event. The, um, the experimenter varies to have the impact on the variable. Okay. The dependent variable. So, what she ended up doing after they did all of the artwork, uh, one group, which was one that was competing for prizes, and the other group was was just doing it for fun. There was no. It was going to be a raffle at the end. There's no competition involved. So the one she was thinking that the ones who were competing and knew they were competing for uh, prizes were going to do better, you know, when they uh, were graded, than the ones who basically were going to be raffling. And there's no no pressure based um, on them. Okay. So the conclusion here, as you can see, they she had people from the art. Uh, teachers from the art department coming in and actually doing the grading and she had a scale that everybody would do the same one and they would grade and then she would figure out who um, you know what which one which group was more creative based upon what the art teachers were grading uh, and she found which was interesting because remember her first hypothesis was that competition will create more creativity the more competitive things are, if you're actually working towards something and there's pressure on there, then you're going to be more creative. That was her hypothesis in the beginning. What she found was that, no, it actually went against the creativity. So the people who were not pressured, the ones over here in the control group, who had no kind of, of um, pressure whatsoever, they knew it was going to be a raffle, they are just going to have fun with it, they were more creative. Why do you think that is? Okay, think about that. Well, have you ever been in a situation where you have test anxiety or you're pressured into doing something? Your mind shuts down. You're not creative anymore. You're not able to have that energy flow through you and understand things that you're doing or at least be think outside the box. If you don't have any pressure on yourself and you're like, Cool, I'm just going to get this done and work on it and get her done and see what it comes out to look like. No pressure whatsoever. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. You're going to be more creative. So whenever you're, let's say, taking a test or exam and you start feeling pressure and stuff like that, that's where you have to relax and let things flow. Therefore, your creativity and your, your, your ways of thinking are going to be a lot more uh, free-flowing because that's what creativity is. Creativity is looking outside the box. And, and and just trying different things. The more you try different things, the more at ease that you're going to be. Okay, so um, tell you that's pretty much the uh, the results of that. I'm going to end there. If you have any questions, please let me know uh, and uh, make some comments on the bottom there. And hopefully you get something out of this. Uh, key things to remember. I want you to is uh, again, be a critical thinker. Don't let people just tell you, well, this is the way that it is, so you're going to have to do it that way. No, 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 no. Life isn't about that. You have to be a critical thinker, even about yourself, too. You know, an internal explorer, which is what I wanted to explain earlier when I'm going to do that, um, is one who takes a look at themselves and say, why do I think the way that I think? Where did that come from? And they also critically think and, and also question. So question authority, question yourself. Um, you know, that's the only way that you're going to grow. If not, then you stay stagnant. Research will allow you to really go into and, and, and put together those pieces of the puzzle. We're all different pieces of the puzzle ourselves. When you get into personality, I'll talk more about that too. But we all have our own little pieces of the puzzle and life situations and things like that that make us who we are. And if you stop and take a look at that and start to realize that you have those different pieces of the puzzle you start to you know be more at peace with things if you don't question especially when things are coming out of nowhere 
I had this thought I didn't want to say it, but okay. And sometimes people will pull things out of their ass. I'm sorry. That's I just had to say. It. I'm just gonna say it. And you know they don't have any kind of evidence whatsoever. They don't. You know, it's like, well, show me the, show me the research. Okay. Then if there's a research, then you know, tell me how many people did they study. Well, they only had like five. Well, that's not very good for reliability or validity. Okay. So those are the type of things that you want to take a look at and question. Okay. So if you have any questions, let me know. This is Dr. O signing off and have a good one. Ciao. Let's see how this works. Come on. Here we go. Boop.